for your kind of perusal. And let's start with uh, a question about radicals. So question number one in the section about radicals, You've got four radicals here, and it just asks us which one is the least stable. Now, this is one of those questions where I would have to admit it's kind of you either know it or you don't sort of thing. Could anybody tell me which one of these, you know, I know it's early in the morning, which one of these would be the least stable? There's one of these here that's a no-no, a big no-no that I told you in organic chemistry. It's going to be B, isn't it, right? The reason Luke said it's B, and he's correct, is because this is a vinylic radical. Vinylic radical. And that means it is very unstable. Super unstable. Whenever you have a double bond, like two no-nos in organic chemistry, or if you have a double bond with a positive charge on it or a double bond with a radical on it, those are both big time no-nos in organic chemistry. I mean, this one here would be the most stable. This would be the most stable because it's secondary allylic. So you could draw a resonance structure like this. So that's certainly the most stable. Um, this one doesn't have any resonance contributors and this one doesn't either, but there's nothing particularly unstable about them. However, the vinylic radical is particularly unstable. And so the answer would be B for this one. Okay, next one we're going to take a look at is number four. So let's scooch over here to number four. Oh boy, a question about intermediates. And this one's dealing with anti-Markovnikov addition of bromine across the double bond. However, since this double bond is symmetrical, there is no Markovnikov and there's no anti-Markovnikov. It's just adding HBr. And when it says peroxides, so peroxides, that's the same thing as ROOR, right? So you need to know a little bit about the mechanism of the addition of bromine, uh, or sorry, of HBr across a double bond. Could anybody just answer this one without me going into all the details immediately? This, again, is a chapter 10 question. Anybody have an idea which one of these? Yeah, thanks, Kiana. Absolutely, absolutely. Because what Kiana is saying is she said, well, look, Mr. Dion, what's going to happen first is that you have the peroxides, right? And that undergoes a heterolytic cleavage. So that's your initiation, right? So you end up producing a radical. You'd end up with two of these oxygen radicals. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, that's going to react with HBr. This is still considered part of the initiation, like this. So then we end up with we end up with an alcohol, plus we end up with a bromine radical. This is kind of the key player, right? Is the bromine radical. And once you make the bromine radical, what that's going to do is the bromine radical is going to add itself to that double bond. So you're going to end up making a bond. Well, that's not the prettiest arrow, maybe like that. And you're going to end up with a fish hook here. So the intermediate that you're going to end up with is this intermediate right here. Because the bromine radical adds to the double bond. So you end up making the bond between the carbon and the bromine. And then you end up with a radical. Then, of course, that does a hydrogen abstraction in the end uh, from HBr to produce another bromine radical and to give you the final product. Anyhow, so the answer to this one be, would be A. So make sure you know... The mechanism of HBr and peroxides, anti-Markovnikov addition. Again, you don't have to consider that with this question, but you still need to understand how the mechanism works. Give me a thumbs up if you follow me on the mechanism of HBr addition. Even if you're thinking, you know, what, Mr. Dion, I got to look at it again. I'll review it one more time. But uh, you know, I understand the crux of it. Okay, great. All right. Well, let's take a look at question number five. And this is again. I'm going to just zoom in on the question to start. It says, what is the expected product of this reaction? So you're taking this compound. So look, you've got an aromatic ring. You've got a propyl group over here, propyl. And then you have a methyl group down here. And you're treating it with bromine and like. So what's going to happen here is this is 
going to be a benzylic bromination, right? We're going to get bromination at the benzylic position. However, we have a benzylic position here that I'm highlighting in yellow. And we also have a benzylic position that I'm highlighting in green, two benzylic positions. So what's going to happen after we form the bromine radical, the bromine radical, oops, where's my pen? The bromine radical is going to abstract one of the protons from the benzylic position to make a benzylic radical. Could anybody tell me which position would be, would make a more stable radical? Like, would you want to make the radical where the propyl group is? Like this, one, two, three. Would you want to have the radical here? Or would you want to have the radical on the methyl group? So one, two, three. And then if we had the radical here, which one of these do you think is more stable? The one with the yellow highlight, oops, the yellow highlighter on it or the green highlighter? Which one of these radicals do you think is more stable? Yeah, absolutely. It's the one with the green, right? So since that position is going to form the more stable radical, that's where the bromination is going to occur preferentially, right? It says, what's the expected product? It doesn't mean it's necessarily the only product, but the major product is going to result from the bromine being installed at that position where the green highlighter is. And so this would be our major product. Yes, you're going to get some of A minor. OK, you get a little bit of this, but this would be the expected product, the major, major product by far, because this radical is secondary benzylic, benzylic. And this radical is primary benzylic. And we know that the more R groups you have surrounding a radical, the more stable it becomes. And so there's the answer to the question. Nothing more than just kind of understanding free radical stability. Make sure you know benzylic bromination. So I'll scribble that down here. That's the whole topic here. This is benzylic, benzylic bromination, bromination. All right, there we go. Okay, next question was, I think it's number six because I circled it, so yeah. Next question is number six. Oh boy, which reaction gives an efficient synthesis of one bromo, two methylpropane? Let's see what we got here. We've got this, no, we've got different starting materials. We've got an alkane, an alcohol, a couple of alkenes. Could anybody just look at this one and answer it? There's one answer that's, Certainly correct. It's going to be C, isn't it? Right. OK, all my students kind of seem to nail that one. Right. Why do we know that? Because HBr and peroxides with this alkene, we're going to get anti, anti Markovnikov addition. Therefore, the rich are not going to get richer. What you're going to end up with is this CH3, CH, CH2, and your bromine is going to be on here and CH3 down here, which is the correct product. So that's the answer. On D, what you would end up with would just be where you have one, two, three carbons. Maybe I'll draw it this way. One, two, three. You end up with the methyl group. Then you have a bromine here and a bromine here. So that's just bromination. This one is treating an alcohol with HBr. That's just going to give you an elimination, um, you know, followed by, uh, so you're gonna protonate that and make a good leaving group. So you'd basically just end up with this compound. And the last one, I mean, that would just give you the, be the, the most stable radical. So you'd just end up with this compound where you have a bromide here. So the answer is clearly C. It's the only one that's anti-Markovnikov addition of HBr. I drew the same thing here. Hold on, I think I made a mistake. I mean, C is the correct answer. I'm just saying I made a mistake in my picture of B. So yeah, in with B, you'd also end up getting the same product as one because that would undergo a rearrangement. So there we go, sorry, made a little mistake on that one. Okay, next we have question 10. So let's scribble down here or scroll down here to question 10. All right. 
again, this is the same old question that we have kind of looked at from the get-go. It says, at which of the indicated positions would the bromine radical react the fastest? So let's say you had a bromine radical, BR radical. Where is it going to react the fastest? Could anybody answer this one for me? Would it be A, B, C, or D? At protons, you know, at the position one, two, three, or four, as they're labeled here. All right, it can't be A, because if it reacted at A here, then that would give you a, a vinylic radical, okay? That's a big no-no in organic chemistry, okay? I repeat, you cannot make a radical like this. So one, two, three. This is a no, no, okay? You cannot do that. But in B, if you pull a proton off of there, then you end up with a benzylic radical. So you end up with one, two, three carbons, and you end up with a radical here, and it is benzylic, benzylic. And so the answer is going to be B. I mean, there's nothing wrong with radicals here, but they're not nearly as stable as the benzylic position. So we want to go with the benzylic position. All right. There we go. So that's that one. Next one is number 12. And we'll move on to oxidation and reduction. So let's see here. Number 12. Um, what is the product formed in this reaction? So we are taking. Um, this compound, so let's just draw the structure of the compound. So we have this compound, so this is acrylonitrile, and then we're treating it with a radical initiator. Um, I'm going to write here, skip this one, because this is, we didn't cover this, so I must have put this one in by accident. This is a chem. 3111. So my mistake, we'll skip that one. Skip, no big deal. All right, let's move on to oxidation and reduction, which is the next section. So I'll just level with you. If you have, if you, you know, downloaded the study guide, you'll find that I picked very few questions out of here because most of oxidation and reduction, it's mostly, it's mostly chem 3111. Chem 3111. We only look at a little bit of redox chemistry in organic chemistry one, but we could do this problem here, which deals with ozonolysis. It says um, ozonolysis of which terpene would give equimolar amounts of these compounds. So a terpene is just a naturally occurring a compound that has 10 carbons. You don't even need to know that to solve the problem. But remember, the ozonolysis of an alkene was where we took, you know, let's say you have an alkene like this, okay? You treat that with ozone, followed by DMS, and that would give you two equivalents of acetone is what you'd end up with in this case. And so if we kind of look at all three of these, right? If you look at A and you split the bond here, you split the bond here, okay, what would you get? Well, you end up with this part here, which would give you acetone, this molecule. You end up with um, this part here, which would give you this aldehyde. And then the last part, um, you'd end up with a carbonyl here. So you'd end up with a methyl ketone on this side. Then you have one, two, three, four, five carbons, and then an aldehyde. So let's see here, one, two, three, four, five. Hey, what do you know? I guess the answer must be A, okay? So that must be the correct answer. I mean, you can eliminate B right away because if you were to cleave here, you'd end up with formaldehyde, okay? So you, there's no formaldehyde in any of the answers. The same thing here, if you were to cleave here, you'd also end up with formaldehyde. Formaldehyde is not in there. And then with this one here, if you were to cleave right here, and I mean, of course you cleave here too, but if you were to cleave at that position, you'd end up with this aldehyde, which has only one methyl group and one hydrogen. And we don't see this or this in any of, as any other possible answer. So the answer would be A. Give me a thumbs up. Could you solve the ozonolysis one? 
Remember the little skill builder that we looked at where you take the eraser and you basically just erase the double bond and draw an oxygen at each end? So that's how you would solve this one. You know, if you really wanted to get down to the nitty gritty, you could draw each one of these compounds on scratch paper and then kind of erase all the bonds and then see what you get. But I think the way I did it is a little bit faster. Let's try question number six. Okay. Question six, I think, is one of those ones where you either know it or you don't. Okay. It says reduction of a triple bond to an E or a trans double bond can be accomplished with which set of reagents? Could anybody answer this one? I know you can. How do you make a trans double bond? Yeah, everybody's correct. Yeah, you use sodium and liquid ammonia. Right, this should be the answer. So A would be the answer, right? And it's because you proceed through a radical anion intermediate, right? Where you have a radical and an anion. So this is the radical radical anion, which isn't just an intermediate, but you want those two sets of electrons to be as far away from each other as possible. So you end up with the trans. If you were to use um, hydrogen with deactivated um, palladium, that's the same thing as saying like deactivated palladium is the same thing as Lindlar's catalyst, Lindlar's catalyst, but that would give you the cis. Okay, that gives you the cis alkene. Okay, one more question from out of here. Again, you can see a lot of the questions are things that we never looked at. This one here. Which set of reagents would you to use to affect this conversion? So if you look at this starting alkene, right, you can kind of think about it like this, where you've got you know, the methyl groups coming out towards you, son of a gun. You've got the methyl groups coming towards you like this, CH3, CH3, and then you've got the hydrogens going in back like this, right? So, you know, if you imagine that as being flat, well, if both of the hydroxyls are sticking up, that means that this is the sin, sin addition of um, alcohols. Could anybody tell me which one of these sets of conditions will give you sin addition of an alcohol? Yeah, thanks, Nicole. You're 100% correct. It's C. This would give you sin addition. Okay. Or the other conditions that we used a lot when we were practicing was a catalytic amount of osmium tetroxide and N methylmorphine N oxide, NMO. That was another set of conditions we looked at. But yeah, just sin addition of an alcohol across a double bond. And let's move on to a big section, which is the section on spectroscopy. And, you know, this is one section that it might be worth your while to just read through what they think the expectations are. You know, you kind of have to know these absorbances by now. You know, you want to know where an alcohol absorbs the oxygen-hydrogen bond different hybridizations of carbon-hydrogen bonds, triple bonds are around 2100 to 2150, a carbonyl is around 1700, you got the aromatic bonds, you know, I'd say they're 1600 to 1475 is usually what I think of. Um, so yeah, aromatic. And then for NMR, they go into sp3, pi systems, carbons attached to oxygens, Aldehydes, you should know that, around 10. Carboxylic acids go all the way up to 12. Aromatics are around 7 and 8. Uh, stuff like that. So those are the kind of things you definitely want to have. And then they have carbon-13 shift. So you want to know sp3s are around 10 to 30. But if they're attached to an electron withdrawing element, they go to 50 to 70. Then you get up into your sp hybridization, like alkynes. And you get up into alkenes and aromatics, then you get up into esters and amides, carbonyls, ketones, aldehydes are really high as well. So those are the kind of things that you need to know. So let's start with question one. And it says, which ketone will show a carbonyl absorption at the lowest frequency 
in the infrared spectrum. So you might remember the formula that we looked at, which was wave number is one equal to one over two times pi, two times pi times c times the square root of f divided by the reduced mass. Okay, so you know all of this is a constant. Pi and the speed of light are a constant. Okay, but f is related to the bond strength and the reduced mass is obviously related to the mass of the atom. So you could rewrite this and say, well, wave number is proportional to the square root of bond strength over mass of atoms. So we'll put here bond strength, and we'll put here mass, mass of atoms. All right, so we have a carbonyl here, here, here and here. You know, what's the difference between these carbonyls? Really not much, except for there's a double bond in a couple of them. Okay, so what's going to happen is how can the double bond affect the carbonyl? Well, the only molecule in here that has something that can affect the carbonyl is B. B has a resonance structure that you could draw where you delocalize these electrons and you end up with a resonance structure that looks like this. So we end up with something that looks like this, uh, like that, okay? So what does that tell you? It tells you that if this one has a resonance structure, that that double bond has double bond character, but it also has some single bond character. So what happens is that when you have a conjugated double bond, since it has partial single bond character, it weakens the bond. Therefore, the bond strength of this carbonyl is weaker than all of them, and the bond strength is in the numerator. So therefore, it's going to have the lowest absorption frequency of all of them because of bond strength. So we can scribble that down here, put uh, weakest, weakest uh, CO bond because of resonance, resonance, which, which leads to lower wave number for the absorption. Now that's a concept that we looked at at the very beginning of the IR. Does anybody remember that? Thumbs up for anybody remembering that. It's something that we only looked at briefly, but it is a concept that was covered in class. All right, so if you didn't remember it, well, now you remember it, okay? And you know you don't have to memorize this entire formula. The main thing you need to know is this here, is that wave number, the stronger the bond, the higher the wave number, and the smaller the reduced mass, the higher the wave number. All right, cool. Oop, just threw the ruler down there. There we go. All right, let's take a look at number two. Here we go. Let's give this one the old college try. Just says which compound is most consistent with this IR. We've got a ketone, an aldehyde, an alcohol, and an ester. Could anybody answer that one pretty quickly? I know you know the answer. Tracy, did you put the answer already? Yeah, okay. Yeah, you guys are very fast. Okay. So the answer is C, right? Okay, the answer is C. And how did everybody know that? Because we have the oxygen hydrogen stretch of an alcohol. You could also say that this here is probably the CO stretch. But the dead giveaway is this is an alcohol. An alcohol. And C is the only one that's an alcohol. So there you have it. Okay, let's move on from there to question three which is up here, same thing, IR. Oh, you can even see I have some scribbles on here, uh-oh. Anyhow, let's see if we can figure it out. It says, which is the most reasonable structure for a compound with this IR spectrum? Well, the first thing that I notice is if you make a line, and I know this isn't the greatest photocopy in the world, but if you make a line at 3,000, um, you know, and you could make another one at 1700. Let's make another one at 1700 just for fun. You can clearly see that this is not an alcohol, not an 
alcohol. So we can scratch this one off right away. Another thing, the reason I scratch this one off is because there's no CH absorption. So there's no um, SP hybridized carbon CH stretch because those come out around 3,300. So we can scratch this off too. So now it's between an aldehyde and, a, and an ester. Does anybody have a guess? And I don't mean a guess, I mean a hypothesis. <laughs> Would it be A or B? Or sorry, A or D? Anybody have a feeling about this one? Yeah, I think you're all correct. How did you guys know it wasn't the aldehyde? That's my, I, I'm wondering what your rationale was. Or how did you know, how did you know it was A? There's two things I would say. Yeah, okay. Yeah, exactly. Nicole and Nicole both have good points. So Nicole says, okay, well, you've got an absorption around 1700. That's the carbonyl, okay? But I think this one is a dead giveaway here. You have something right here, right? If you draw a line here, okay, where is that line? So let me get the ruler out of the way. I mean, if that's 2000, this is 2100, this is 2200, and maybe somewhere around here, but this is for a carbon-carbon triple bond stretch right around 2150, something like that. OK, so, yeah, that's that one. And another thing is that whenever you see a gigantic absorption around here, around, you know, 1100 to, to 1300, super strong absorption, that's the carbon oxygen absorption of an ester. So with all those things, another thing I would say is that you don't have the aldehydic stretching, so there's no, no um, aldehydic stretching. No CH stretching at what is it, 2850 and 2750 reciprocal centimeters. None of those things are there. You can see there's nothing here. So, since we don't have those, it must be A. Great, great work, you guys. I like solving problems by the process of elimination. It's a lot of fun doing that. Uh, let's take a look at number four. Oh boy. Okay, this is one that I bet you if you saw this, you'd be feeling pretty good about. Your answer, does anybody have an answer for number four? Which structure is consistent with this IR? Yeah, I'd say it looks like B to me, right? I mean, this is a gigantic stretch. This one goes from here to the highway. I mean, this goes from around 2,500 all the way up to, you know, 3,300. This is the oxygen hydrogen stretch. Not of an, this is not an alcohol. This is a carboxylic acid. Carboxylic acid. Okay, this is the carbonyl of the carboxylic acid. This is probably the CO stretch of a carboxylic acid. So the answer is a carboxylic acid. That's a really huge oxygen hydrogen stretch. Uh, next one we had was number 11. So I'll scroll down to number 11. All right, let's see here. Oh, number 11. How many signals would be observed? in the what is it the car oh, sorry the proton decoupled carbon nmr so proton de decoupled just means um uh, all carbons are singlets everything that we looked at was proton decoupled so don't worry about that i think the best thing to do here is to draw the bond line structure of the compound because it enables you to view symmetry a lot easier. So if we have this like that, okay. Now keep in mind that there is free rotation around this sigma bond. 
If there's free rotation around that bond, that means that all three of these carbons are chemically equivalent. There's no difference between any of them. This is the only quaternary carbon in the entire molecule. This is the only um, methyl, this is the only CH2 that has an sp3 hybridized carbon in it in the entire molecule, this one right here. So that's unique. This carbon is completely unique. It's the only sp2 hybridized carbon that's attached to three distinct carbon atoms. This is the only unique methyl group off by itself. And then I'm running out of colors here. Let me get in my color wheel here. Where's my purple? Here we go. This is the only other thing in here. This is the only CH2 that's sp2 hybridized. So those are all the unique carbons. So how many carbons do we have total? We have one for the yellows, two, three, four, five, six. So we have six unique signals. Does everybody follow me on the whole rotation of the bond so that you know that this tert butyl, this is a tert butyl. Okay, cool. Right. So in a tert butyl, all carbons are equivalent. So there we go. Six, six signals is what you'd see in the carbon for that one. Let's try question number 12. Question number 12 is just looking at an NMR spectrum and can you figure out, you know, which which spectrum does it match here? Uh, let's see. Let's go for the low-hanging fruit. It says, question number 12, which structure is consistent with the, this proton NMR spectrum? My question to you is, what do you think, like, where does this come from? You have a signal at 10. Where would that come from? What's the only thing that we've seen that would give you a signal at 10? Exactly. So like Kiana says, this is an aldehyde. Therefore, we can scratch out this ketone. We can scratch out this ester and ether. But this is an aldehyde and this is an aldehyde. Okay, so we have an aldehyde. Next question I have for you. What about when you have a doublet of doublets at around 7 and 8? Does anybody remember what this is? I went over it with you a couple of times. But just because I said something two times doesn't mean I expect you to remember it for the rest of your life. Does anybody remember what this meant when you had something in the aromatic region? Exactly. Yes. Yes, Clinton, you nailed it. Yeah. Okay, so what that means is that you've got symmetry on an aromatic ring. So you've got, a, you've got an aromatic ring. And on one side, you've got an X group, and on the other side, you've got a Y group, okay? So we the, there's a name for that. I'll tell you what it is. It's called para-substitution, substitution, okay? Para-substitution. And that tells us that the answer must be C, okay? It can't be A because C is para-substituted. You've got something at this carbon and something at this carbon. Now, the rest of it, you see that we do have free rotation around this carbon-nitrogen bond, and so these two ethyl groups are chemically equivalent. But what do you see from an ethyl group? If I highlight this methyl group in yellow, or this one, could anybody tell me, what would, you, what would these three protons produce? Would they produce a singlet, a doublet, a triplet, or a quartet? Those three protons that I have highlighted, they're both chemically equivalent. But what would they give you? Singlet, doublet, triplet, quartet? Exactly. They're going to give you a triplet, right? You're going to get a triplet for these two because they're coupled next to two protons. And the two protons that I have in the blue circle, okay, those are going to give you a quartet. There you go. Then if you look over here, we have a quartet and we have a triplet. So there we go. And the quartet is more deshielded because it's closer to the nitrogen, which is very electron withdrawing. And so the answer has to be C. Just like that, we figured out the entire thing. Okay, so that was 12. Let's take a look at 13. In the same vein, okay, it asks us, uh, here's a proton NMR. 
and it just says which one of these structures is the most consistent with the spectrum. So if we draw the bond line structures, which I think is very good idea, bond line structure of A is this. The bond line structure of B, one, two, three, four, is this. The bond line structure of C is this. Uh, CH2OH. And the bond line structure of D is one, two, three, four. That's this. All right, there we go. So is there anything that anybody recognizes in the proton? Just looking at it and say, hey, I think I see something that I might have seen before that we went over in class a few times. Yes. Yeah. So what my students are saying is, Mr. Dean, I think there's an isopropyl in here. And I think they're right. Here we have a signal that has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And it looks like even more signals. You can't quite tell. But that is at minimum a septet. We'll put here greater than a septet because it looks like you've got little peaks. Look, it looks like you've got little bumps down here and here too. It almost looks like a non-et, really. Um, we'll put, and a non-et is pretty rare. So we'll put here non-et question mark. And then here we've got a doublet. So we've got a doublet that integrates for six protons. And then we have that septet or bigger that integrates for one proton. So which one of these compounds would have that in it? Would it be A, B, C, or D? Oh, I see Tracy already answered it. Yeah, so it's going to be... It's going to be C, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And then if we draw the structure here, Okay, like this, and if we label these peaks A, B, C, and D, we'd say, okay, well, these are the A protons because they're only coupled next to one proton, so they produce a doublet. This would be the B protons because it's coupled next to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, which would give you a, a non-et. So maybe this is eight and nine here, I don't know, could be. And C would be these two protons, and then D would be the alcohol proton, like that. All right, it's definitely not a tert butyl because you don't have that anywhere. It's definitely not this because you'd see um, you'd see a triplet in there, right? This would give you a triplet. All these would give you a big singlet that integrate for nine, so that's not in there. This would also give you a triplet, so you can tell right away that it's not. A, B, or D. It has to be C. Give me a thumbs up if you're like, you know what, I think I could figure that out. I had a piece of scratch paper in a few minutes, Mr. Dion. I can't answer that in 10 seconds, and I wouldn't expect you to. I would not expect you to. I would expect you to be able to look at it and kind of figure it out. Okay, cool. All right, good. Rome wasn't built in a day, and neither was organic chemistry and learning organic chemistry. Okay, let's try one more. Uh, this one, question 17, let me just show, I put this one in here because some of you, and I know I bring this up once in a while, but some of you, not all of you, have expressed an interest in writing the MCAT exam for medical school or the DAT for dental school, or I don't know about the PCAT, nobody's told me about that, but somebody might be thinking about that. So all these different standardized exams. And in those standardized exams, sometimes they'll give you a, a, a carbon spectrum that looks like this. So CDCL3, that's the solvent, so you can ignore that. But they put little T's and Q's and S's. What that means is it's like the N plus one for how many protons are attached to the carbon. So when you see a Q, that means you've got a CH3. When you see a T, that means you've got a methylene. When you see a doublet, that means you've got a methyne. And when you see a singlet, that means you've got a carbon with no hydrogens attached to it. So that's what they're saying here. So it tells you that the compound 
has a CH3, then a CH2, then a CH3, then a CH2, and then this is a quaternary carbon. It's got no hydrogens attached to it. If it's all the way up here, it's going to be a carbonyl. So you've got two methyls, two methylenes, and a carbonyl. If you go down to the answers, I mean, look, you've got two methylenes, two methyls, and a carbonyl, two methylenes, two methyls, and a carbonyl, two methylenes, two methyls, and a carbonyl, and two methylenes. Uh, there's no carbonyl in this one, so we can cross off D. Okay, so it's got to be either A, B, or C. We'll cross this one off because there's no carbonyl. All right, give me a thumbs up if you're with me so far. Any questions so far? We've just kind of taken the carbon and we've eliminated D. Okay, so now we're going to get into the proton. We've got a triplet that integrates for three protons. So that means you must have a CH3 next to a CH2, right? Because that's the only way you could get a triplet. Then we have um, something here. This looks like one, two, three, four, five, six. So that means you've got a CH2 that's coupled next to five protons. That means you'd have to have another CH2 attached, right? Because this would be attached to five protons, which would split into six. Um, and then you have another methyl by itself somewhere. It's not coupled to anything. And then um, this CH2 here would have to be these ones, right? And then this one would be this. So this must mean that you have a propyl, a methyl, and um, a carbonyl. So these are the pieces, but look here. In A, you've got a propyl, a methyl, and a carbonyl. In B, you've got a propyl, a methyl, and a carbonyl. And in C, you've got a propyl, a methyl, and a carbonyl. Well, crap. I mean, that doesn't help. Pardon my language. But this is a tough problem because A, B, and C would all give you the same splitting. So what's the next thing that we're going to do? We're going to look at what? Chemical shift, right? That's the only option we have is we have to look at chemical shift and see if we can figure it out according to chemical shifts. So let's let's do that. So that means you've got to go back to that table where we added, you know, um, uh, parts per million depending on what the group was attached to. So let's start with A, I guess it's as good a place as any. We start here, a methyl is has a baseline of 0 0.9 parts per million. We add, um, Oh, shoot, we had three parts per million because it's next to an oxygen. So that would give you 3.9 parts per million for your triplet. And it's at one part per million. So that can't be it. So we can scratch this one off the list. Let's go to the next one. With B, you've got 0 0.9 parts per million and it's alpha to a carbonyl. And so you would add, um, you would add sorry, I was looking at the wrong one before. Okay, so let me take a step back. I was getting ahead of myself. So this signal here at three point nine would be this one that's not split by anything, but that's not high enough. That's not 3.9, that's only at 2.1 or something. So for the second one, you take 0.9 and then you add one part per million to it and you get 1.9 parts per million. And that makes sense, okay? So that matches. Then you go over to um, these two right here. So you take the baseline of a methylene, which was I think 1.2 parts per million. And then you add one to that and you end up with um, 2.2 parts per million for the triplet. That makes sense because you got 2.1, 2, 3. So that's close enough. The next one, this one here, where's my red pen? This one, you have um, 1.2 parts per million plus you add one fifth of one because it's beta to the carbonyl. So you add 0 0.2 and that gives you 1.4 parts per million. That's pretty close right here, and then the last one, which is the triplet, would give you a baseline of just 0 0.9 parts per million. So this 
it looks like B is the correct answer. And you can check that because this set of pro this set of protons right here would be the triplet that integrates for two protons, right? It should be this thing right here, but that's going to have a chemical shift of 1.2 plus 3, which would give you 4.2, and it is too high. And so the answer has to be B. So B would be the correct answer. So what are you going to have to do to answer a question like that? You should review that table of chemical shifts to make sure that you can accurately predict chemical shifts in a problem like this one. All right, let's go down to synthesis problems, synthesis and analysis, and let's take a look at question three. And this is a question straight out of chapter nine, or this is chapter nine chemistry. So chapter, chapter nine. All right, so what's gonna happen here is in the first step, we're taking propine, methyl acetylene, whatever you wanna call it, and we're treating it with sodium amide. And the sodium amide is gonna rip off the terminal proton so that you end up with the alkanide like this. In the next step, you treat it with methyl bromide. So we're gonna hit it with this, like that. And that's going to give you 2-butyne, which is this compound. Then the next step is Markovnikov addition of water across a triple bond, water, sulfuric acid, and mercuric sulfate. However, there's no Markovnikov or anti-Markovnikov to consider here. Um, so all you're going to do is end up adding water across that bond so that you end up with something like this you have the hydroxyl here you have a ch here and then ch3 but remember this is called an enol and an enol is going to undergo tautomerization to give you a ketone so what you end up with is a methyl ketone in the end so the answer is a for this one just a little bit of chapter nine synthesis so if you need to review your alkynes chemistry be sure to do that. And the last two questions from the study guide are way at the end. Most of these ones would involve organic chemistry too. There's only a few that don't. Uh, so this one here. Okay, question 24. It says you have an optically active alcohol with the molecular formula C5H8O, and it undergoes hydrogenation over platinum, so that's H2 over platinum, to give an optically inactive uh, alcohol. Which of these alcohols is consistent with this data? So what it means when it says optically active alcohol, that means you've got something that's chiral. Okay, that's your starting material. So you would want to look at each one of these and ask yourself, are any of these chiral? If you look at A, B, C, and D, could anybody tell me, do any of these not have a chiral center in them? That's my first question. Do any of these not have a chiral center? Yeah, C and D, right? There's a plane of symmetry here, and there's a plane of symmetry here. There's no chiral center in C or D. Put here, no chiral centers. Therefore, we can scratch out both of those. A is optically active, right? If you draw the bond line structure of A, you've got a hydroxyl, you've got a carbon-carbon triple bond, and then you've got a hydrogen atom, put the hydrogen like this, and then you've also got a um, ethyl group like this. So A is definitely chiral. And then if we look at B, you can draw a bond line structure for that. And I'm just guessing at the chirality. I just put the dash in the wedge wherever the hell I felt like it. Pardon my language. Just to have something there to think about. 
So here, and then here we have CH2, um, and then we have a carbon-carbon triple bond. So both of these are chiral, A and B, but what it's saying is you're going to take this and you're going to treat it with hydrogen over platinum or hydrogen over platinum. And then it says you end up with something that's uh, optically inactive. So it says you end up with something that's a chiral in the end. So which one of these is going to produce something that's a chiral after it undergoes hydrogenation? Right, if we copy this. Okay, so if we hydrogenate both of those, what do you what do we end up with? Well, with this one, we're going to end up with this, where we've got an ethyl group on this side, and then we've got an ethyl group on this side, right? This is one, two carbons. Whereas the one in blue, after we hydrogenate that, we end up with a methyl group on this side, and then we end up with a propyl group on this side. So this is chiral, right? Right, whereas this is a chiral. And so the answer would be this one, the first one. So let's go back into the problem. So the answer is going to be A, because after hydrogenation, you end up with this compound, which is a chiral. But with B, you end up with this compound, which is chiral. Done. All right, and the very last one is, oh boy, this one's a long one. It says, which of these reaction sequences will affect the, this transformation? So what's gonna be the best way to take this two butyne? So that's this compound, okay? So we're starting with two butyne, this guy here, and we wanna end up with this compound where we have the two hydroxyls like this. And then we have two methyl groups, one coming out of here. So we end up with a meso compound in the end is what we want. All right, let's just kind of go through them, you know, kind of one by one here. I might have to erase them because I don't have a ton of space. But what the first one is, if you took this, you know, with one, if you took this and then you treated it with H2 and Lindlar's catalyst, you end up with the cisalkene. And then it says you're treating that with osmium tetroxide and H2O2. That's the same thing as using, like, it's like using NMO. So that means you'd get syn dihydroxylation. So you'd add both of the hydroxyls on the same face of the molecule. So in that case, you would end up with the right thing. That would give you, you know, both the hydroxyls on the same face of the molecule. So that means it's got to be either A or B. So we can cross off A and D. I mean, you can see why number two doesn't work, right? Because you're starting with the same compound, but then you're doing the same second step, but the first step is different, right? Here you're making the trans, and then in the second step, you're doing a syn dihydroxylation. So you'd end up with this, but you'd have one methyl going down and one methyl coming up. You'd have that plus the enantiomer. So this is not going to work. All right, so we know that one works. We know that two doesn't. Now I'm going to erase those. So if I just erase all this stuff quickly, like that. Now we're going to look at three and four. Oops, I didn't mean to do that. So now we're going to look at three and four. So I'm going to cross off number two again here. So cross this off. So now if we look at number three, we're taking and we're treating it with um, H2 and Lindlar's catalyst again. So that's what deactivated charcoal is. So we end up with the cis alkene. Then we treat it with peroxides followed by base. So this is the same thing. Let me go over here. This part here is the same thing as going one ROC3H and two H3O plus. It, it does the exact same thing. So that's an anti addition. And so you'd end up with one, you know, one methyl group going up and the other one would be coming down like that. Okay, so that's not going to work. So we can cross this one off. So 
So there better be an answer. C had better be the correct answer. So that means number four had better work. We're in trouble. So let's check number four. And we're starting with same starting material. We're treating it with sodium and liquid ammonia. So we end up with this. And then you're doing the two step, you know, anti addition. So um, anti addition, just like in number three. So then after all that, you're going to end up with anti addition is going to produce the desired uh, compound where you have both of these coming out like this. So the answer is one and four. C. That is a question where you would need to, and you need to make sure to review your anti addition processes and syn addition processes before coming into the final exam. And that does it for all of the review. Now, just one more thing I want to point out before we end is that the suggested practice problems that I have posted in that file are only for organic chemistry one. If you look at the study guide, there's all kinds of questions like this one here where it talks about a tetrapeptide. We didn't study that, okay? These are all things that are covered in organic chemistry too. So I handpicked questions that deal with organic chemistry one only, but the study guide is good for both semesters.